Okay, I'm recording, so watch your language. Um, he said to himself, um, I've done some looking at the calendar, I've done some soul searching, whatever kind of thing, and we you know, we're supposed to have the next test, what, November the, like the 8th, 10th, something like that? That's next Thursday. Today is Tuesday. Next Thursday. We will still have the test on that day. Because if I move it out and ask you to squeeze with the amount of time for test number four, so we're going to have a test with only three weeks worth of material somewhere along the line. So I'm just leaving it where you live. So um, as far as what's going to be on it, you know. Um, but I am going to endeavor to speed up slightly because as I'm looking, I'm like, we got, we got some ground left to cover. But some of it we've already kind of covered in some of the random going random directions that y'all pulled me down. So we've seen some of it already and y'all need to know they, um, so we go with that. Um, sometime next. Tuesday, I'll let you know what, you know, where, where the cutoff is going to be for the test kind of thing, but an interesting lap is still for Tuesday. It's going to probably be on the test because it's, you know, I need to have more than one class meeting to work this out. Because we had part of the class the time before the test, right? And then we've had one class meeting since the test, class test, right? So that would be one and a half class meetings, and we get two this week, so that gets to uh, three and a half class meetings. And I might have to go back and look at that again. That's still, dude. Okay. So, um, I might have just lied to you when I said I'm going to leave the test on whatever you take this because I apparently didn't count. So, unemployment. I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to try to speak through a little bit of this. Um, we, I use wages and income as the example when I was discussing novelty, the real TV thing. So we should hopefully already have the concept. Nominal wages, that is the number that was on the front of Jenny's paycheck. For Jenny's sake, out of her mind, quote unquote. So anyway, there you go. Um, and Kay is like, she thinks she's got the flu. So if you see, if you see her stay definitely away, Jenny, probably what you should stay away from her anyway. And yes, I recorded that Jenny she has the flu too. Oh, she's saying flu now too, so yeah. okay, all the more reason to avoid the flu. So, uh, the nominal wages, that's the number that's on the front of Jenny's paycheck. Real wages is how many bottles of Dr. Pepper we're talking about because that's what Jenny was buying, right? You translate her paycheck dollars into the number of bottles of Dr. Pepper she gets to take home. That's real wages. And this is what we're working for to get the Dr. Pepper, to get the Sun Drop, to get the Cheetos, to get the whatever it is that you buy. Preston does not rehab, so he's not buying drugs anymore. Good for you. Um, no feedback whatsoever. So, uh, but the amount of, but of course, the amount of Dr. Pepper that she, Jenny's going to be able to buy is based on, well, what's the price of Dr. Pepper, but it's also based on the nominal wage. What's that number on the front of her paychecks? If the nominal wage goes up, well, then she sure won't be able to buy more Dr. Pepper, right? If the price of Dr. Pepper goes up, she's going to be able to buy less Dr. Pepper unless her paycheck goes up at the same point. We've already seen that, so I'm going to keep going. Here's the example. If Jenny's paycheck goes up by 8%, but her the price of Dr. Pepper goes up by 5%, well, she can buy only 3% more Dr. Pepper, but that's 3% more Dr. Pepper. So, that is a real income increase, and that's real. That's three more bottles of Dr. Pepper she can drink. And generally, what comes from this? I, I've said at some point along the line that business is a partner. It should be seen as a partnership between the company and workers. Yeah. So the business's income is the prices that they charge, right? Your income is your wages. Well, if it's a partnership, well, if their income goes up by five percent, your income should go up by five percent, right? And that's kind of what I've been telling you to tell your boss is if they're making 5% more, you need to get 5% more because it's costing you 5% more to live because that's what inflation is, right? But what is it going to take for you to be able to say, I want more 
then that five percent increase. I want a bigger piece of the pie than I was getting before. To get to justify asking for a pay raise higher than the prices that they're getting, to ask for an income increase greater than the income increase of the other workers, greater than the income increase of companies, because you can do more, right? Productivity. And that's kind of the thing. The more you can do, a lot of you, some of you that are planning on staying in the same job that you're already at after you graduate, and you're kind of expecting to get a pay raise after you graduate. Why? Because you're going to be able to do more, right? That's why y'all are working here and getting the knowledge and experience, that kind of stuff, the knowledge, skills, and abilities, that kind of stuff, to where you can do more, they will pay you more. That's the whole thing. But flip side is real wage increases leads to inflation. Because if my workers are saying I want a bigger piece of the pie, then what am I going to do? I need a bigger pie, right? Because I want to keep getting mine too. This is business owner, so that may tend to make me want to raise my wages. I mean raise my <laughs> prices as well. So it's kind of when she can then take things. When you raise rate down the prices, how do you get a good rate? Oh, that again? Say, say, that's what you say, right? They want to increase, you gotta have to raise the price. But how raising your price is your base, like we said, your partner's giving you that piece of yeah. supply, you want your same piece. If you're raising your prices, you're basically, you're basically making the pie itself bigger. Yeah. So you can get that same piece. What he said. So. This is the one time, generally, when we, when we talk supply and demand, we usually think of ourselves as on the demand side of things. We think about us as being customers. We're buying the soda, we're buying the video games, we're buying the chainsaws, we're buying the butter, we're buying the whatever we're buying. But when it comes to labor, y'all are on the supply side of things. Because y'all are supplying the labor that businesses are demanding, or not demanding, right? The businesses say, we need workers, I want workers. Just like you say, I need Cheetos, I want Cheetos. Man, right? So the supply of labor, well, it's a little bit fuzzy here. It's the number of people willing and able to work at different wage levels over a different time period. But it ain't just that. Just sort of think willingness and ability to work. But we measured it's not just the number of people, but how much they want to work too. Because you can have a bunch of people say, yeah, I'll, I only want to work two hours a week. Well, that ain't a whole lot of labor, right? Compared to having two people that say, yeah, I want to work 40 hours a week. You know, it may be so. It's not just how many workers want to work, but how much work do they want to work. Where the demand for labor is the employer's willingness and ability to hire people. How many workers do they want? How many hours do they want the workers that they want? Part-time workers, now businesses say, well, I only want to work by people 29 hours or less because I don't want to have to provide them with health care, health benefits, right? So they went from saying, well, I need three people working 40 hours a week. Now I need four people working 29 hours a week, right? So I get the same amount of work getting done there. But you take the demand for labor, the supplies for labor, put it together, and ask it to determine the price of labor. And what is the price of labor? Real wages. Just like when we took the supply of donuts, the demand for donuts, put it together, and we see people every how many donuts get made, and what's the price of donuts? Well, you get the same mechanics here. Um, if we were to graph this, which, boom, there we go. I thought I did. Um, we see supply of labor, demand for labor, and ask you to determine what is the wages. What happens if the population grows. We got more people graduating high school, but yet businesses decide, yeah, we're not going to hire any extra people. The demand for labor doesn't happen. What happens? Wages are going to go down because there's more available workers out there. So supply is really increasing. Yeah, there's going to be more workers out there. Wages go down, and then hopefully what ends up happening is that with lower wages, some businesses are going to say, well, we'll go ahead and hire more people. It's not that we necessarily want to, but we're getting bargain at it. Otherwise, you may end up getting unemployment. What makes a company say, 
I want workers. I want more workers today than I had yesterday. I want workers instead of not having any workers. First is demand for what? Yeah. If I'm selling more, then I need more workers. Right? If I'm selling less, I need less workers. So it starts with that. And how much stuff do I think I'm going to sell is going to help determine how many workers that I need. What else? How much work can I get out of these workers? Productivity. And that one can cut both ways. Number one, it cuts down to the, well, you know, if I can get some good quality workers, yeah, I'm willing to hire. But if I got to get a bunch of, you know, hire a bunch of people that can be goofing off, horse playing, doing drugs, that kind of stuff on a job, forget about it. If I can hire people that I can trust, yeah, I'll hire people. If I can't hire people I'll trust, I'll get a machine to do the work instead. Hint, hint, wink, wink. Substitution of labor, machines, right? What's that payoff there? Or what's that trade off? That's the word. What's the trade off there between how much does it cost me to have a worker to do the work versus having a machine to do the work? You know, I have to pay a machine to help benefits for a monthly wage. Yeah. Machines don't call in sick, machines don't steal things. But machines don't come with the flexibility of, we're not producing as much this week, so I'm going to tell the workers, I can't tell the machine to stay home and I'm going to put, not going to pay you this week. Because you still got to make the machine payments. So your machine payment is going to be fixed cost, and a lot of it may be a huge fixed cost, but it's a fixed cost that you got to go to next semester. We're really getting into that. Take accounting and we'll just start bleeding the eyeballs. It's a fixed cost. But it doesn't call in sick. Well, occasionally they do call in sick. I mean, yeah, computers get a virus, but all these windows. All right. Uh, Y'all didn't get down. Windows is the virus. Anyway, I, it is. I promise not. Anyway, but just, but then there's also the one well, the new technology and stuff may cause the well, I'm sorry, may cause people to get laid off. The whole scenario I had last week about two secretaries for the typewriters. Being replaced by one administrative assistant with a computer. So you got the one worker that can work more, but that one worker can work enough more that we don't need a second worker. So productivity, it can cut both ways. The price of substitution machines, as machines get cheaper or as workers get more expensive, it's going to make you more attractive for businesses to go with machines. Thank you, boards, McDonald's. That's screen word boards and stuff. <sighs> Oh, no, I uh, just say anyway. uh, I just got to the text like what you do or something else, but yeah, uh, you start with McDonald's. If you don't look in the back of a fast food restaurant or something now, like Pizza Hut, how do they cook the pizza? They couldn't trust these 16 year old kids to cook the pizzas without burning them and that kind of stuff. So, what happens? It's on a conveyor belt. It's on a set temperature, going at set speed, and we've done the math. We stick the pizza in on one side, when it comes out the other side, it's going to be cooked perfectly. Because we couldn't, yep, we have spent, I don't know, $5,000 or whatever to buy that machine. But we couldn't trust the kids to do it themselves. So guess what? They only need one person to be sitting there making the pizza, sticking it in, making the pizza, sticking it in, making the pizza, sticking it in, instead of having three or four people. Making the pizzas one at a time, standing over the oven with paddle and lifting up the bottom of the crust every 30 seconds and that kind of stuff. The machines ended up making it a lot cheaper. For us farmers, getting hay. It used to be we had little square hay bales that weighed 40 or 50 pounds, that kind of stuff that you can sling around and that kind of stuff, but we couldn't get people to help us get the hay out of the field reliably. So we're using $20,000 round bales and we can do it all ourselves. Because we couldn't find workers to do work because the work got more miserable because it's hot, it's sweaty. Have you ever rolled around when you were a kid in wet grass? Does where itchy come to mind? Well, yeah, when you're hot and sweaty, you're throwing hay bales, 30, 40 pound hay bales in on a 90 degree weather, like eight stacks high on the back of a pickup truck. Yeah, you're sweating, you're itching. So to keep from itching, you're wearing long sleeves in 90 degree. The workers wanted a bunch of money, right? For good reason, I guess. Yeah. So, so, for good reason, yeah, not good reasons, yeah, depending, but it just that's trade off. Suddenly, it's becoming more and more expensive to get workers. Suddenly, I can get this machine and do it, cheap, do it all, do it cheaper using the machine instead of you, right? 
So that is the one day, you know, I tell y'all, if y'all are doing well at work, you know, ask for a raise. If you're being more productive, ask for a raise. If you're not any more productive and you ask for a raise, you're asking to make this bargain go against you, and you're making it more likely for the boss to say, well, let's see if I can find a machine to do what this healer is doing. And that's kind of the danger where some of these Amazon workers were complaining and whatever, they, they got a pay raise. But then some of them are losing other benefits on the side. And what's Amazon doing? They're like one of the leading investors in robotic technologies and this kind of stuff. But they've got robots going in various places in their distribution center doing a lot of the work. You got to be careful. You don't go too far. But what makes us decide we want to get off of the couch and get a job? Or for those of us that have a job, what makes us decide I need to work more? Instead of working five hours a week, I want to work 30 hours a week, 40 hours a week, 80 hours a week. I need more money to buy stuff. That's going to be, dude, I still have it up. I've got it on my slides that I use. I can like, do some of this in 201, 202, but I don't have it here. Uh, but it's kind of related to uh, change in. Change of needs or wants, change of life situation. Okay, lovely. Remember when I told you that I like you and respect you? That's all about change. Lovely. How old are you? 20. 20. Lovely. She's 20 years old, but she's her parents' favorite, right? Yes, she's her parents' favorite. They, they love her. They get, When she turned 16, they gave her a car to drive back and forth to school. She still gets to use it. They, even now, they give her money for gasoline to come to college. She's living. They sort of set up the basement of her house in a little apartment thing. So she doesn't really have to go upstairs to interact with her parents unless she wants to. Yep, they, they take care of the she moves food. She can... They, it gets mom to do her laundry for her, all this kind of stuff. They give her gas, they care, do it, they rotate the tires, and check oil changes, all that kind of stuff. She has nothing except get up and go to school and come back. And they even give her an allowance if she wants to do stuff like get some new clothes or that kind of stuff. She can do that. She wants to get a video game. Well, maybe she's got enough money to do that stuff too. Maybe not, but if not, her boyfriend will pick up slack on the rest, right? Does she need to work? No. no. Is she going to work? No. She doesn't, she doesn't need the money. So she ain't going to work. But then the incident happens. She has visited. <laughs> she wakes up one morning. She is pregnant. With an alien love child, eight tentacles, four eyeballs, all this kind of stuff. Daddy's like, not my little girl. Mama's like, they ain't got nothing to do with that. No, uh, no, 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 just whatever. Life seriously, you were abducted by an alien. I don't think so. You were, you're not the good little girl that we knew when we raised for the first 20 years. So. Who are you? Get out of our house. You are a stranger to us. We didn't know. Get out. So now what? Oh, and by the way, on the way out, you can leave the keys to the car on the kitchen counter. So now what? Her life changed. Would you agree? Yeah. So guess what? She needs money for her car, gas, food, diapers, you know, eight tentacle alien is going to work. So guess what? That's seven diapers at the time. She started to you know, two tentacles, two tentacles, and the second and third, and the third, fourth, going all the way around. <laughs> is she going to need some money? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Is she going to be looking for a job? Yeah. Oh, yeah, right up until she can sell her story to TMZ, right? And hopefully make enough money then where she could be okay with it. Hey, alien love child, eight tentacles, something like that. I dare say TMZ will pay a few bucks for that story. Right, or just sell your baby. Sell your alien baby. Or... Have you degenerated to that point to where you would sell your alien baby? No, because luckily she almost was a nice girl, so I don't. She, I don't think she can do that. Almost, almost. 
Yeah. <laughs> All right. Almost, because she anyway. Because I still a little bit doubt with you. Was she truly inducted, or did she go on her? No. <laughs> but these these kind of she's going. Her need food to work has changed. She went from I don't need to work to I need to work a boatload, right? So she's going to be asking for more hours because her life situation changed. For some overall, generally, change in demographics. As our family size, we're getting smaller, we're getting more single parents. So then we're got, well, if we're a single people household, well, then that means we all got to work. It ain't like you can have two people married together, one of them stay at home and sponge off of the other. That goes out of the way. Um, as the price of the goods and services changed. If Dr. Pepper gets more expensive, Jamie still has to have her eight Dr. Peppers a day. And if the price of Dr. Pepper goes up, that means she's got to work that much more in order to be able to afford to keep drinking her eight Dr. Peppers a day. I'm kind of going up to the bottom of the list of y'all. Some people, the main reason why they work, and this is going to be the main one for Loveline, is she's going to need health insurance. Would you agree? This baby, she will need health insurance. It's just... She ain't got the money they're just going to take to pay a doctor to deliver this. I'm just saying. So there are some people that the main reason they're working is health insurance and that kind of stuff. Life insurance, retirement benefits, that kind of stuff. I'll be honest with you. I'll be able to retire. I'll have my 30 year service when I get 60. I will be able to retire then. Not going to happen. Because when I turn 60, my wife is going to be 63. And it's going to cost a ton of money for health insurance. So I kind of think uh, I got to work for another couple of years till she gets to 65 and she can get on Medicare. So then once she can get on Medicare, then okay, then maybe I can retire. So I'll put in two years and then for the paycheck, it's for health insurance. Yes, my wife is a career. Okay. But she's hot, so that's okay. <laughs> Not cold to that. <laughs> And, I, and I'm saying that honestly because you know she was a leader for it. So, okay. Well, then I've done nothing wrong today. Fair enough. In, in her eyes, I've done wrong today. Love things like, what do you mean you've done nothing wrong? You just got to be feeling low time. Okay. So, what does this word look like? Yeah, it looks an awful lot like Monopoly. What is a Monopoly? Besides that game you hated playing when you were a kid because your older brother used to get mad when you started beating him and you flipped the thing over and punch you twice and walk away. You control when the business is all this and you lost soul supply. Yeah. One company controls the selling, one company controls the production in the industry. What, what, what's this chapter about? Workers, labor, that kind of stuff? What do you think a monopsony is? Yeah, very close. One company has all the workers. One company controls the hiring. The company has a monopolistic power over hiring. Uh, did you live in the Emporia area? Area? The word settler comes to mind. Just about every business in town belongs to somebody with the name settler. So if you take off one of the settlers, well, you ain't gonna have a job in town anywhere, right? That would be a form of a monopsony. Generally, the company has a large portion of the labor for the area, and for this to really work, the labor force has to be immobile. That's why the one company has power, because workers don't go anywhere else. They can't go anywhere else. And when this happens, the company becomes a wage setter. I'm going to charge, I'm going to pay you what I want to pay you, because if you don't like it, what are you going to do? You ain't going to leave, and there's nobody else here to hire you. Welcome to West Virginia. Back in the 1910s, 20s, 30s, 40s, it's nothing there but what? Coal mines. And maybe one bleak seventeen between forty nine and fifty. But that's what ended up happening in, in West Virginia. It's like you either live in this holler and you dig in a coal mine, or you're working at home for mom and dad on the farm. It ain't much of a farm because it's on the side of a mountain, right? And mom and dad ain't paying you, right? 
Well, you can get a job working in the local school. If you're one of those three or four people that are educated enough to do that, you could work in a store, but ooh, the store belongs to the coal mine company. You work in a hotel and restaurant that belongs to the coal mine company. Because nobody had the money to do. So you either working for a coal mine company or you ain't working. So if you come up complaining about you know, I want to pay a raise, they tell you shut up and get out. Right? And oh, by the way, I'm docking you an hour's pay because it's going to be digging coal instead of standing here in my office complaining. And if you don't like it, shut up and get out. Because there's other people that I can replace you with. So wages generally end up being very low in a situation like this. So I had that in all the years I worked for black folks and crying. I'm so glad you asked. The unions, unions come about with the workers, because any one worker, Sam comes up and complains to me, I want to pay a raise. I say, shut up and get out. And if you don't like it, there's plenty of other people that I can hire. And hey, by the way, Loveling is about to have a kid that's got eight tentacles, so that kid's gonna be able to do seven times work of any of the rest of you. Score, right? So are you sure you want to make this fight? Get out. So any one of you complains, I fire you. But all of you come up at the same time, middle fingers in the air. Well, guess what? When y'all are all in my office at the same time complaining, is there any coal coming out of the ground? No. So then I start having some issues. Well, what do I do? I tell you, shut up and get back in here. I'll fire you and then I'll replace you. But the idea is, so y'all are grouping together saying, well, any one of us doesn't have power, but all of us, and it's got to be about all of you, all of us, we have power. All of you as a student, uh, dirty people say, all of you as students, you had the power, you could all conspire and get one of the instructors trying to get fired. You all could get around and you could all could start saying, let's every one of us slide this instructor down and his course evaluations and let's make sure nobody signs up for their class in the next semester. So from the college head to the instructor that had no students and nothing but bad reviews, how long do you think that instructor's going to be here? Not very long, right? But if any one of you is like, well, I'm not going to sign up for Mr. Scales to do our Okay, right? But if all of you do that, I got a problem. So the idea is collective bargaining. If we all negotiate together, we have power. Um... And generally, they start working toward the, well, we need higher wages and better working conditions because you think these coal mines were spending a whole lot of time doing, like, safety equipment and that kind of stuff? No, what do I care if you get killed because there's plenty of other people out there that can replace you? As long as somebody drags your body out of the way, right? So the unions were gathered together. They, they were making this push for, let's get some higher wages, get better work conditions. We've got to threat. But what? But the union has to. The union has to negotiate, and they've got to play it out. What is a threat? We're complaining now. Well, we're going to stop working, and we're going to keep not working until you cry out because there ain't no coal coming out of the ground. That's called a what? Strike. A strike. You all are going on strike. None of us are going to get any coal out of the ground. We'll show you. Ha ha ha. But your job isn't done when you flip me off and walk out of my office. Because if you say I'm not getting any more coal out of the ground, well, I can do what? I can go out there, I can hire some other people and have them come in and start digging coal, and you're just sitting home cooling your heels, getting nothing done. You have now a new job when you go on strike. You're no longer digging coal out of the ground. Your job is to keep other people from coming in and taking your place. That's what the picketing is about. When they're out, when they're out there with the signs, you're saying, don't work for this guy, he's, he's evil. He's terrible. He's going to treat you bad. He's probably going to get you killed. And he's a jerk and whatever. Some of those words that are in those jokes that Preston was, was going to tell earlier, but he can't use those words. Right? Okay, and you got to stop your replacement. Because if I can replace you, you lose. But if I can't replace you, then you got me. Because then I got to start answering the corporate headquarters down in Charleston and start to say, uh, why are these train cars coming back in? And they, where's my call? So y'all do think, but you can't just sit there, like, you, can't lock, you can't break the law. So you can't be like locking the gates, that kind of stuff. You can't be coming in there. It, so you got to be, 
you can't be like threatening people or punching people or that kind of stuff. But you can do the oh, so man, so man, you you you, you want to go to work or something like that? Well, gee, it would sure it would sure be a shame if like I don't know. You, your dog ran away and got killed the day while you were at work, you know, just stuff happens. That would really be a shame. It would really be a shame if your house is to accidentally burn down while you're down there digging in coal mine. You know, accidents do happen, but you know, it, it would sure suck. And to, whatever you can say to get him to start thinking, but, you know, what do you do? You start talking about how evil and low pain and dangerous the work is, right? So you don't really want to work for a jerk like sales because... Scales and jerky that you do like terrible, and that's y'all's job is to keep your replacements from coming again. It becomes a game of chicken. Who's gonna blink first? You who doesn't have any money coming in because you ain't getting paid because I ain't getting paid. You go on strike and I give me coal. Or me who ain't sending coal to corporate headquarters and they're coming down my like, we're paying you to get these people to get coal out of the ground, not sitting there playing minesweeper on his computer. But then it ends up being a game of chicken. That's that's really what you need to end up doing. So ultimately, what ends up happening is a negotiated labor contract comes out where some stipulations about how high the wages are going to be, how much they're going to get approved, how the work conditions are going to get approved, so people don't feel like I'm going to get killed if I go to work today. That's what we need to bring to the table. What says over there is a high. Uh... Oh yes. But here's the thing. Y'all all band together and y'all, let's see, uh, y'all get Allison to negotiate on the path. Allison is going to give you a murder letter. So the rest of y'all, because y'all are like, what do we know? You can't have 85 people crammed into an office all at that. So you hire one person. Like so Allison negotiates, said me paying you $5 an hour, now I got to pay you $25 an hour. Well, what's going to end up happening? I'm going to say, well, if i got to pay that many, that much money per worker, what am I going to do? I'm going to get rid of some people. But you already pay some of them. The rest of them are going to, the rest of you that I keep, the good workers of y'all that I keep are going to get paid $25 an hour, but there's some y'all that, I'll, let's be honest, y'all only work $25 an hour. So y'all stay home. All right. Because y'all increase the wages, it's decreased my demand for labor. And suddenly I'm thinking, well, instead of getting, having a bunch of humans down there with pickaxes, I'm starting to look at like, like steam shovels and that kind of thing, jackhammers and all that kind of fun stuff, right? So y'all may end up pricing yourselves out of a job. Where I live, Henry County, the city of Martinsville, the next county over Pennsylvania County, the city of Danville, we were big for things like furniture manufacturing, textile manufacturing, t shirts, sweatshirts, socks. That's what we were doing. The school system in the county was geared toward making workers to graduate and go to work in one of these furniture or clothing plants. The people who are on the town council are the people that own those businesses. Y'all ever heard of Bassett Furniture? It's one of the big ones. It's from Bassett Virginia. Uh, American Martinsville, uh, Marshall Virginia. How do you think Lily Beauty Marshall Virginia afforded it to have a racetrack? Still is on a NASCAR circuit now. I said in the middle of nowhere because there used to be some money there. There used to be some big companies there. But what ended up happening is, you know, we, let's say, some our high schools, the school system weren't the best plan. It had to be produced in the for big uh, But you ended up having workers that were working there. There were this is back when minimum wage like three thirty-five an hour when I was y'all's age. The, yeah, three third cut. Um, but the you can have people working these textile plants making twenty bucks, twenty dollars an hour, five times the minimum wage. That would be like somebody now making about forty dollars an hour. Is that a good job? Yeah, for somebody who just barely made it through high school. Yeah, good job. Then what ended up happening? How does Allison get paid? She's your union representative. She's no longer. She quits working for the coal mine. She her job is to represent you. Y'all pay union dues. Y'all say, okay, Allison, we'll give you 5% by, by, by paycheck. So if I'm only making $5 an hour, I'm giving you, what's that, 50 cents? Whatever that number is. But, but, it, 
if yeah, and everybody's giving fifty cents in, so she's suddenly making five dollars an hour to negotiate not to be down to take it to no But if she can get y'all for five dollars an hour to twenty dollars an hour, guess what? Each y'all is giving her two dollars an hour for every hour you're working, she's giving two dollars an hour. Store. But then how does she make more money? She's like, I'm gonna take my services to the next holler down the hill and I'm going to negotiate on their behalf and get them a deal. I want more members in my union, more people paying me money. So the unions have this drive to add more and more and more human beings to the roles of the union. And that's why you've got unions like the truckers union has like typewriter repair people and cook it. Has nothing to do with truckers. They just like whatever they can do to get more and more people paying them money for each hour. So, Allison is like, wait, who's the next people that I can negotiate on behalf of? Who's the next people I can negotiate on behalf of? So somewhere along the line, some union representatives showed up in Martinsville and they started talking to the workers in Martinsville about the, hey, guess what? You know, we've negotiated a better contract here, better contract there, better contract there. Vote us in. And let's see what we can do for you. And the problem is, is once the union gets in in one plant and wages go up in that one company, because they did negotiate a better, better deal, so wages did go up because of the union. But then what ended up happening? Where's everybody in town want to work? Over there. So what do the other companies have to do? They either have to raise their wages or guess what? The union is going to go to the next plant over so you can see what I just did for those people. Well, I can do that for you. Join the union. So either way, prices on wages went up an interesting percentage in a good chunk of the furniture and textile companies in Martinsville. And woohoo, the workers were happy for like two years. The ones that got to stay. The ones that got to stay, but then after a couple of years, what ended up happening? Well, dude, it's bad enough we were paying like $16, $18 an hour. Now we got to pay $22, $23, $25 an hour when we can pay Chinese workers. $2 an hour. Over half of the furniture companies and over half of the textile companies in the county shut down. Gone. Just devastated the economy in Henry County. Our population is almost half of what it was 15 years ago. Because there's no job, a bunch of people left, but then a bunch of people are stuck. They can't leave. Because, well, they're stuck with a house payment, or one of them's got the job and the other one doesn't, and they can't afford for the one in order to quit in order for family to pick up and move somewhere else and the other one to get hired. You're trapped. We went from having five high schools in the county to three high schools in the county, and they're nowhere near fully back anymore. The county, sure. Even now, Marksville, Henry County, Danville, Pennsylvania County have the highest unemployment rate in the state. Because they just got Completely torn to pieces, and unions were part of that. I mean, I'm not putting all the blame on unions, but that's just a part of what has happened. Between. It just sped up the process of where our American workers are demanding higher and higher, higher wages. Makes machines or overseas labor look a lot more attractive and become actually affordable. I so, mean, the unions are good to get it like. Price like like um, the equilibrium uh, and or that's they can bring you higher wages and better work conditions, but they lead to higher unemployment, which is ooh, the labor. We're here for the workers. By doing what we're doing, well, we're going to cause a few of you lose jobs. But here's the thing: ultimately, when did these unions pop up? A like hundred some on you, a hundred years ago, hundred hundred twenty years ago. Where were these unions popping up? In places where there was monopsonies. Coal mines in West Virginia, the mountain area in West Virginia, United Auto Workers, where are the cars made? Michigan, what else is up there in Michigan from 100 years ago? Nothing. Steel, the Steel Workers Union. Where, where are they at? Pittsburgh, what else is there? Nothing. These unions are springing up in these areas where there's like nothing else. So the people, so they were what? The, so the workers were being victimized. Do we really have that going on here in America anymore? Not really. Among other things, we have OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, 
they kind of take care of the work conditions thing. The you're not going and you don't have to worry about what well, any day that I go to work I might get killed because there's inspections and that kind of stuff. There's rules for safety equipment and that kind of stuff that employers have to follow. Oh, and guess what? We got a minimal wage law that says, well, you can't pay workers two dollars an hour, right? So the need for unions is kind of fading here in the United States, but they still have their place in other parts of the world where the workers are dramatically and systematically being taken advantage of by a monopoly situation. So I don't want to come off completely negative toward unions, but I say in the modern world, we need a union about like we need a typewriter. But there are places in the world, there are places in the world where there is no electricity and the typewriter is a fantastic thing, right? So, do the unions work on capitalism countries or all countries? It, yes, it a little bit depends on how you define a union. In a certain expect, certain respect, you could even consider the Communist Party a union. Because in a way, that's kind of what it is: is collectivism working together. It's supposed to be one giant union of all of people. Kind of thing. And that is a communism is a centrally controlled non uh, capitalistic economy uh, system there. So, yes. An oligopsony, you may be heard of an oligar oligarchy or oligarchy. This is when you have, instead of one, you have a few people that are controlling the hiring. And that's the example that I was actually talking about about Martinsville and Henry County, where you have a handful of furniture companies, a handful of textile companies, and you either work. Working for a furniture company, working for a textile company, or you working for a business that was supporting the workers of the furniture companies, textile companies, namely the schools, teaching their kids, the hospitals, treating their injuries, the restaurants that are feeding them on Friday and Saturday night. That's pretty much most of the economy. That's why when those companies shut down, everything was getting butchered there. But if you have just a handful of companies that are controlling the hiring, well, then they get the thing where they could compete with one another to, well, I want to get the best workers that we have available, so I'm going to pay a higher wage than anybody else. Where they could all get together in the back room somewhere and say, well, look, if we all agree to pay the same wages, then it ain't like you be stealing all my good workers. I'm not going to be stealing all your good workers. Nobody else could be stealing our good workers, and together we do okay. They could do that. It's illegal, but they could do it. it. Example is like, just pretend downtown Alberta has a Hardee's, a McDonald's, and a Wendy's. And you have Alberta High School. Really, a uh, series of Alberta University, right? Well, literally Blackstone. Yes. Yeah. Oh, Blackstone's part of the Wendy's. But, yeah. but it's, anyway. But let's just keep this simple for the so the graduates from Alberta High School are either or the 16-year-old kids from Alberta High School either work at McDonald's, work at Hardee's, work at Wendy's, right? There's nothing else. So if McDonald's, Hardee's, and Wendy's are each paying the same wage, well, which one is the worker gonna stop at first? Shutting a job. One that's closest to their house, right? But what if McDonald's was paying seven and a quarter, Burger King is paying seven and a quarter, Wendy's is paying eight dollars an hour? Where should everybody go first? Wendy's, right? So then Wendy's is getting all the good workers. So then Burger King and McDonald's just said, well, we're fighting over the leftovers. Uh, no. So what are they going to do? Raise their wages. They're going to raise their wages too. So then you end up with a wage war. So then, well, but Wendy's is going to say, well, we weren't happy with having a third of the good ones and a third of the dummies. We wanted more than a third of the good ones. So that's why we raised our wages first. Let's do it again. So you end up with this wage war going up and up and up. Or the three managers that sit there in the back room somewhere and say, we all promised that none of us ever pays more than seven and a quarter. Well, then, then none of us will ever pay more than seven and a quarter. Because if we go into and we start competing with one another, then next thing you know, wages are going to get $10, 12 $15 an hour. And we're probably going to end up coming up with the exact same balance of a third of the good ones and a third of the bad ones anyway. So why pick the fight? They should compete with wages to get the best workers when they could cooperate, cooperate secretly. But they have the incentive to cheat, and it is illegal for them to do that. I think I have, oh, no, I don't. It's illegal for them to do that. If they get caught doing it, they go to jail. 
But then, okay, the manager, Wendy says, okay, I'll pay seven and a quarter. Y'all you know, promise to pay seven and a quarter too. But then I see the uh, very good worker coming around. And I don't want to risk them going somewhere else. Might I cheat off of them a little bit more? Just I need my hundred eighty dollars now. Well, you probably got a promise to go tell us. So, all right. If I find that you told somebody that you got paid more than seven and a quarter an hour, I fire you. But you're screwing up my business. Does that still happen? Yeah, it would happen. The whole agreement would get busted pretty good. So overall, it's better that we have more than one employer because then they end up competing with one another. Because we have a choice. If we don't like what happens at McDonald's. We can't move on. If we have a disagreement with our manager at McDonald's, we can't move on. So we have options, and whenever we have options, the price that we have to pay is lower, the price that we receive is higher because we have options. Is it monopolies, whatever that means, or uh, that control all, you know, the hiring is illegal as well? It, to, a monopsony, like a monopoly, it depends on how they got that status as being the only game in town. The government generally frowns on it, but to, if you're the convenience store in Dundas, is there any other employers? No. Is it their fault that there's no, no other stores in Dundas? No, because there's nothing else in Dundas. There's only like 50 people that live there, right? So in that case, they got there naturally and they didn't do anything evil. Now, if you know, a company like, well, we're going to run everybody else out of business, so then we can't control all the hiring, control all these workers over, then they do get in trouble. So, minimum wage, for the fun of it. Did we talk about minimum wages this month? Some point? Barely. Or maybe a little more. Generally, generally, the minimum wage in the United States is seven and a quarter an hour. In case you didn't know, the minimum wage is the lowest amount of pay they can give you per hour. And guess what? Here's one. Come on. Oh, no. No, they broke it up because. They, they sometimes. They uh, changed that link and I updated that link and then we broke it again. Uh, okay. Uh, this, uh, that means I'm not really going to be all the time. So basically, the seven and a quarter is just the minimum wage that, like, the federal government set, but each state can set their own. Yeah. The minimum wage, yeah, here we go, okay. Seriously. Why, why are you change the link if you don't have it? That seven and a quarter an hour is a guideline. It is a recommendation that the federal government has. The federal government doesn't have the power to set it. They make a recommendation. And if you follow the recommendation, maybe you can get some extra assistance from the federal government for doing things their way or not. Just like 55 mile an hour speed limit is not a federal law. That is a suggestion that the federal government had, and they said, states, y'all need to cap it 55 miles an hour or 65 on the interstate. And if you do that, we'll give you extra money to pick, fix the potholes in your highways so the state could have mm -hmm. went along with it. It's a recommendation. When the dust settles, let's see if the number is down here. 29 states plus Washington, D.C. all have minimum wages higher than seven and a quarter an hour. It's 30 out of the 50. 29 out of the 50 are higher than minimum wage. The leader here, generally, state of Washington. They're the ones who really started doing things. So what they did, minimum wage, the federal number, it adjusts maybe once every eight or ten years. Washington realized that's too long of an adjustment because prices are going up every year. And if minimum wage doesn't go up, well, then what happens to the minimum wage worker? In real wages are lower. They can buy less Dr. Pepper this year than last year, less Dr. Pepper last year than the year before, and even less than the year before that, right? So a minimum wage worker now, minimum wage might buy somebody maybe four bottles of soda right now. Well, when they adjusted minimum wage to seven and a quarter an hour back what, eight years ago, seven and a quarter would have bought that person probably six bottles of soda. So that minimum wage worker went from getting six sodas an hour down to four sodas an hour. That's a problem. 
right? So in the state of Washington, it's like, well, we're going to adjust it every year based on the inflation rate. Every year. Prices go up by 5%, minimum wage goes up by 5%. Prices go up by 10%, minimum wage goes up 10%. Prices go up none, minimum wage goes up none. The same adjustment that the federal government does for Social Security. State of Washington, this is about 150 years ago or so, that they start saying, we're going to adjust every year. And other states like, dude, that's a good idea, and they have adjusted along so, the way. And, but just, I mean, they started from seven and a quarter, and then whenever they started their adjustment, they just went from there. So, you know, Oregon started probably a year later. So they're a little bit farther behind because they had one less year of adjustment. Something like, so it was a year or two later. New Mexico and someone, 750, they probably just got on board with it. But that's, I personally, I very much love that idea. It really needs to. But it's a little bit of a pain in the butt for small businesses to say, oh crap, I gotta give my workers a pay raise every year. Waste they need to be doing it anyway, right? Because what did I tell y'all? If you don't get a pay raise equal to the inflation rate every year, you're getting victimized. But then you got a small business like all my software, paperwork, and Excel spreadsheets I use to calculate how much I'm paying my workers. And I got, well, I gotta update it every year with the new numbers. And I cannot just give a pay raise, coming to a slightly later slide. Minimum wage goes up. Well, it's more than 50 minimum wage workers that they can get pay raise. Because minimum wage goes up, then all the people that were making minimum wage get a higher paycheck. Well, the people that are getting a little bit more than minimum wage, they want a pay raise too. Right. Because like, uh, if your minimum wage goes from seven and a quarter to eight dollars an hour, then your eight dollars an hour workers make minimum wage all of a sudden. Now. Yeah. So that that person is like, I've been here for three years, and I've worked my way up from seven and a quarter to eight. I say I want more, so if minimum wage went to eight, well then that worker's probably gonna have to get a pay raise to eight seventy five. And then those eight seventy five people are gonna be saying, Well, I've been here six years, now I'm getting paid like a three year person, so then they get a pay raise to nine fifty, right? So it ends up trickling its way on up the hill. We have uh, fourteen states have minimum wage that is exactly equal to the federal seven and a quarter. They just say, Well, we know what the federal government says. That includes North Carolina and Virginia. Two states that we deal with a bunch. Two states, which this number has improved, two states are less than minimum wage, Georgia and Wyoming. Think about the economies of Georgia and Wyoming. What's going on in Georgia and Wyoming? Yeah, not a whole lot. Georgia has whatever's going on around Atlanta, and then they've got a couple of other decent college towns. Beyond that, got a hot, dry weather, right? You know, of course, they, I mean, five states that have no minimum wage whatsoever. That means people get paid a dollar an hour. It just means that there's no guideline on what the lowest can be. If you can find people that are willing to work for seven dollars an hour, we'll be paying seven dollars an hour. If you find some sucker just willing to work for six and a quarter, we'll pay him six and a quarter. But if you got, if you got to pay eight dollars an hour, twelve dollars an hour, fifty-two dollars an hour, well, that's what you pay them. We just then not put a minimum on there. Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, South Carolina, Tennessee. What's going on there? Nothing. There ain't a whole lot going on in the economies there, so they're doing what? Trying to attract business by saying there is almost no minimum for what you pay workers. You can pay workers less here than in any other state because they want businesses to come and pay workers here, right? So this is kind of a marketing campaign for them, bring business to Alabama, bring business to Louisiana. And it might not flood, but once every three years. Because you can pay get a, you can pay workers five six dollars an hour, and guess what? You come in and you offer jobs for like five or six dollars an hour. Guess what? There's people that are out there that are going to take it. But this is better than what they got now. Living at home, making nothing. So these numbers have improved. This is five uh, with no minimum wage. That not, that list has been consistent for a while. You've had this just a few years ago, had a half a dozen states that had a lower minimum wage, um, and more of them are moving here. And I just I personally cannot wait for them to just go ahead and get smart and let's just get smart and adjust it every year. Boom. Because if you don't, there's going to be a big shock. Because what's going to happen? What did I say? A minimum wage worker eight years ago, minimum wage would buy them. 
six, what is it, six bottles of soda? So how much money would it cost somebody to go to a convenience store and buy six bottles of soda now? You're talking about ten dollars. Minimum wage is going to have to jump from, I mean, nine to ten dollars. Minimum wage is going to have to jump from seven and a quarter up to nine or ten dollars. That's a big, huge jump to have to swallow all at one time. And there's going to be some businesses that say, oh crap, I can't afford this 33% increase in my labor expense because minimum wage went up. I can't afford it. Business is shut down. Which it was a whole lot easier to swallow if it's a bunch of little four percent, three percent, five percent, two percent increases year after year after year instead of saving them all up for one big hit at the end. Or like on food line, they don't do a five percent increase. They do it like twenty and twenty-five cents every year, but it's still something. Yeah, every year in April we get raised. And hopefully somewhere along the line you do the math and make sure that yeah, hopefully it is percentage appropriate. But it's good that you gotta do something every year that you if you if it's a bad year and maybe you, you we're barely getting by and just be like we have it completely shut down and you cannot give a pay raise equal to the inflation rate. But hopefully when you can, hopefully you can make up for it. So you long term good employees that have been there a long time will be on the same track that they would have been before the Economy or the go the business hit this new pump in the first place. But isn't it the more um, states that don't have uh, like a minimum wage, the more people leaving out of the states to get a better job? They would, but they're getting a lot of them are kind of trapped because educationally, the education systems for those states are near the bottom of the pile. Um, so that financially the people don't have a lot of money to be able to sell the house, the house they have ain't worth a whole lot for them to sell it and be able to relocate somewhere else and start from scratch. It's kind of tough sledding, especially when they've got however many generations worth of families spread out over all that area and that kind of stuff. I think a lot of the people that end up going to college in their states end up leaving and then don't come back. And we get some of that around here. We get it half a y'all are Gonna be gone from here in a couple of years, and we'll never see you again. Except when y'all come home with Thanksgiving dinner and that kind of stuff. All right. Just that's so you end up losing your more talented people that way. Um, the federal government, you know, they try to do things to they try to smooth things out. So you know, they put a military base where we gotta have an airfield, where we can have it in Florida, where it's spent real estate expensive, or we can have it in. Southern Mississippi, where it's cheaper. Um, NASA did their big rocket thing in Huntsville, Alabama. You know, that's where they were assembling all the rockets and that kind of stuff. It was a reading job where there was no job. The atomic bomb was built where? Yeah. Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Tennessee, there ain't much going on there, but they do have good water that was used for electrical, electrical generation. And for them to get the water, they need to create the hard water to do material in order to and their heavy water for splitting the atoms, all that kind of stuff for, for um, purifying the um, cutting. Yes, I know a little bit too much about that. But just so you know, the, the government kind of tries to do stuff like that when they can get free some kind of thing. Uh, so, why should we not raise a minimum wage? That's this list. What, what are the reasons people say let's leave it at seven and a quarter? Because we already talked about it, you're gonna have to give raises for a bunch of people. If, if what Bobby was talking about a few minutes ago, the you raise minimum wage to eight dollars an hour, all those seven and a quarter people, seven fifty, seven seventy five an hour people, they're getting bumped up to eight. All those eight dollar workers are getting bumped to eight seventy five. The eight seventy five workers get bumped to nine fifty. The nine fifty workers are getting bumped to ten. Ten dollar workers are getting bumped to ten fifty. The twelve dollar getting bumped to twelve and a quarter. It's going to keep going. So where everybody making less than fifteen dollars an hour is going to get some kind of pay rise. So you can be talking about a significant portion of the labor force for the area, or for an individual company. It's going to end up having to cough up an interesting amount of pay raises, and there are businesses that might not be able to handle that. What did we talk about for unions? You give people. Wages go up, people are going to lose their jobs. Just like the price of M&M's goes up, you buy less M&M's. The price of labor goes up, you get less labor. 
bad enough I got to pay these dummies seven and a quarter an hour to be goofing off a horse plane and doing drugs on the job while well, occasionally doing a little bit of work. Now I got to pay them $10 an hour. Forget it. So you will end up causing some unemployment along the way. Here's the fun one. Teenagers are going to get helped better more than the low skilled workers. And the point of this minimum wage is what? So low skilled workers don't get victimized. So low skilled worker is going to be able to make enough money to survive. Y'all take it, how many do you take psychology? Maslow's hierarchy. Yep, you remember that? Minimum wage ain't about the top three. It ain't about affiliation, it ain't about achievement, it ain't about power. Minimum wage is about the minimum that you need for Safety and survival, right? You ain't, nobody is living a large, living a happy life on minimum wage. Nobody is living large if they're related. We'll get to this later, next semester. Social Security. Social Security numbers and minimum wage numbers close together. They're, they're, they're nobody is living large off of Social Security. Because what's the point of Social Security? Security, right? It ain't about making you happy. It's about making you survive. If you want to be happy, you got to go over and above. Save for your retirement. Get it more income than just a minimum wage job. Right. So, so the point is that we, you got people that are out there, like Lovely, she's out there working as hard as she can to make money because she's got expenses. She got a baby on the way, right? She's got expenses, and she's working, doing the best that she can, but the best job she can get is a minimum wage job there because, let's who's going to hire somebody who's pregnant with an alien love child, right? And Loveline graduated last in her class in fifth grade, and that's as far as she ever got. Okay, no, no, okay let me change the story, not Loveline, but, but here's the problem. Here's the story that I'm trying to tell. So, these are the kind of people you want to put. Give me the names of and John. John and I didn't hear the other one. Timmy. Timmy. Okay. John. He is 55 years old. He graduated last in class in fifth grade, and that's as far as he got because he had to drop out for whatever reason, that kind of stuff. And let's just face it. Uh, he's not the brightest bulb in box, not the sharpest crayon in box. So we say. Um, Timmy, 16 years old. John has been working at this McDonald's for 25 years. His job is French fry cook. He knows how to cook French fry. He's got it. You take the bag, you dump the fries in the thing, you hit the button when it beats, you take the basket out and put it in the other thing, you hit the button when it beats, you take the basket out and you set it up there. He can do that. And he's done that well, and he can do that. We can't do hammers, we can't trust it, we can't count the money, we can't have more than registers, that kind of stuff. Cooking french fries, that's all he can do. He's been with the company for 25 years. Where well, Timmy got hired three weeks ago. Timmy, all Timmy can do is cook french fries because he's only been there a couple weeks, that's all he's learned at this point. But you gotta fire one of them. They both are getting seven and a quarter an hour. And you have to fire one of them. Who are you, the manager, going to keep? Who are you gonna let go? John. What about John? Is he the one you keep in or one you fire? Who do you fire? You gotta fire John. You can fire John. How many of you wanna fire John? Besides saying. How many of you wanna fire Timmy? How many of you are like, I don't wanna fire anybody? No, you gotta fire somebody. Fire John. I guess firing John would be the most logical thing to do. John is the target. Because Timmy's got something John doesn't have. And what is that? Young. No, young, that's, that's ageism. Oh, no, you got prison for that. You, you get fine. What does Timmy have that John doesn't have? <laughs> more work than John doesn't He hasn't shown it yet, but the word I'm looking for is potential. Is there a chance that Jimmy will be able to get cross-trained to cook the hamburgers? Get cross-trained to run the cash register? 
maybe one of these days, Tim, you might go to Hamburger U and end up being a manager of a store himself one day. John? No. So if you're going to keep somebody, who are you going to keep? The one that has the potential, the ability to work the drive through or the other stuff, or somebody that can. So who ends up losing their job? John. And that's the very person that the minimum wage was about, trying to protect. Because is John going to be able to get another job somewhere else? Probably not. What about Timmy? He loses his job at McDonald's. He's 16. Guess what? He'll probably be able to get on Hardy's McDonald's or Hardy's Wendy's Burger King, something like that. So Timmy has a lot easier chance of landing on his feet if he loses his job. John, no, but who's going to get hit here? John. So you're ultimately going to be helping the teenager better than the help the higher skill, I mean the lower skilled workers. So we're coming back to that in a minute. Do I need to get rid of the spaces that like bothering? Lovely things are getting pretty over there. Either that or she's like, my boyfriend. The other thing you get is higher prices. If I gotta pay my workers more, what am I gonna do? I gotta pass that cost on to my customers. Oh, and guess what? Ooh, dang it! Because I jacked my prices up, what's gonna happen to the amount of stuff that I'm gonna sell? It's going to go down. Crap. So what am I going to not need? I won't be as many workers. Right? We're going to come back to that one. And so say the people that are on the side, you know, people are going to lose their job, but in the long run. I'm coming around to that one. Sort of. So, okay. But then the other side of the coin is, why do we need to raise the minimum wage? beyond seven and a quarter. These are the arguments for that. Number one is it takes the power away from those monopsonies. Everybody's paying more. So you don't have as much control. The employers don't have as much control because all every company is paying more, so we're taking some of the decision making power. Out of the hands of us, out of the hands of the monopsony, it's like, oh you're gonna shut up and work for two dollars an hour? No. Now it's like you're gonna shut up and work for seven and a quarter an hour. You're gonna shut up and work for ten dollars an hour, whatever that number Number two is if higher wages are going to cause more people to say, well, I'm going to get off the couch and I'm going to try to keep a job. I'm not interested in going and finding a job as the most I can make $700 an hour, but if I can find a job for $10 an hour, yeah. So you should end up mobilizing more workers if the pay is better. That's the argument here. Higher wages, put more money in our pockets. What are we going to do with it? We're going to spend it, right? Buying more stuff, and if we're buying more stuff, what happens? More jobs to make the stuff. Did you know in the last slide just say less jobs? We're coming to that. Then there's also the idea of well, if you pay the workers more, they're going to be happier, loyal, less likely to steal, less likely to quit, less likely to sleep on a job because higher, higher, higher paid workers or heavier workers, more productive workers. So we got the two problems there. Well, we got two problems. Number one, one side of the mouth I said you gain jobs, the other side of the mouth I said you lose jobs. What's the answer? Both. Both. The answer is yes. You gain jobs in some areas, you lose jobs in other areas. Let's come back to John and Timmy. John, 55 years old, what is he spending his money on? Food, rent, insurance, right? What is Timmy, a 16 year old, spending his money on? <laughs> Doritos, games. Shoes. So what ends up happening? You give more money to Timmy, more Doritos, more games, more shoes. So there is an increase in demand for Doritos, games, shoes. So there will be more jobs making Doritos, more jobs making video games, more jobs making shoes. But there is less demand for food, for rent, things that John is going to buy. 
So the demands for the things John is going to buy, those in those businesses making stuff John's buying are going to lose jobs. The businesses making stuff Timmy's buying is going to gain jobs. So you gain in some places, you lose in other places. So what has been the net effect? Over the last, this is 30 good. Over the last 85 years, since we really get, started doing minimal wages, when it comes to job creation versus job loss, the argument is raise minimum wage will create jobs. The results for over the last 85 years has been no. We gain some, we lose some, but overall, job numbers stay about the same. So what ends up happening? We get an increase in demand, we get an increase in supply, the amount of jobs ends up staying the same. Oh, I've got this on the next slide. So I'll go here. No, okay. No, I don't have it on slide. I'm okay. Let's try it. Explain to me. We uh let's see. Demand is going to increase. Demand is going to decrease. What? No, I can't. Never mind. When the dust settles, we don't get more jobs, but what we do get, higher prices. That's okay. Let me try this. Demand, maybe it goes up, maybe it goes down. The products as a whole. A higher minimum wage means what? Harder for businesses to do the work. Supply decreases. Demand. John's demand goes down. Timmy's demand goes up. Right? So what do we end up getting? If anything, we end up with a price increase. Maybe we get an increase in demand to offset prices is what we get. We get inflation, and that's pretty much it. Because we already talked about it. If I got to raise your wages, bless you. you're going to get a bigger piece of the pie. Well, what am I going to do? I'm going to raise my prices too, so I get a bigger piece of the pie too, right? I'm going to pass that cost on to my customer. Prices are going to go up. So guess what? Yeah, your paycheck goes up, but the price of the stuff you can buy with your paycheck goes up too. So all we did is just change nominal sticker prices, right? Which is real, real wages. They end up being exactly the same. But you don't want to be less. That's why you have to increase your nominal. Yes, but the increase itself isn't going to fix things. As far as the economy as a whole, it's going to have a significant change for the individual people. But for the economy as a whole, it's going to end up being a wash. Now let's come back to this last year. This is the other problem area. Go back to Maslow's hierarchy. Pay people more, they're happier workers, and they'll work better. Anybody have a problem with that? Hint, there is a problem with that. Sam was making seven and a quarter an hour. I was paying him the least I could get away with paying him. Minimum wage goes up to $10 an hour. I pay Sam $10 an hour. I am paying him the least amount of money I could get away with paying him. Is my treatment of him changed in any way whatsoever? No. He's still working with doing the same dead end job, working the same miserable hours, working with the same losers and co workers that he can't stand. And he, what is he getting in return? The least amount possible. I am paying him the least I can get away with. Does that inspire any loyalty? No. According to Maslow, if you follow him, job satisfaction and dissatisfaction are not opposites. You can be satisfied and dissatisfied with your job at the same time because they're coming from different things. Job satisfaction is coming from those upper level needs, the need for affiliation, need for power, need for achievement, need for the best stuff. Psychological stuff means you feel good about things. Where dissatisfaction comes from your ability to survive, the safety and survival. Pay and benefits determines dissatisfaction, where it's the work itself and the work environment is what's going to determine dissatisfaction. You can love a job, be dissatisfied with it at the same time. Just ask a bunch of school teachers. They're going to say, 
I love the job. I love that moment when I sit here talking to a third grader and I see a ding, the lights get, they get it. I live for those moments. You can teachers talk about that. But what do they say? Are you sure it sucks? Right? They're satisfied and dissatisfied at the same time. Versus there are some people. I was this morning when I was working for Consigo Finance. The paycheck was good. I was doing okay. Didn't really care for the work I was doing and didn't care for a couple of the co-workers that were sitting there not doing the work and they're talking on the phone the whole time and making me do I had to do extra work to make sure the work got done and the deadlines got met. And I'm not getting recognized because they're over there doing brown nosing, sucking up and that kind of stuff. The management's so clueless that they're going along with being the sucking up instead of actually paying attention to what their workers are actually doing. So I didn't like the job, but the pay was okay. So I was neither satisfied nor dissatisfied at the same time. Where here at Southside, I'm not getting paid as much as I could if I was working for a living. But I don't really consider most of what I do here working for a living. I am satisfied and not dissatisfied at the same time. So my, my paycheck is okay. It sure will be nice to do better. But I really enjoy what I'm doing. In case you'll have no it's an opportunity for me to drink some trouble. And try to confuse people and talk about people's alien love children and that kind of thing. And love them just as a secret. Let's start accusing anybody else of having an alien love child. I'm getting slapped, but in her case, like, well, how much can I slap him without it negatively affecting my brain? You know, you were thinking that. Who am I right now? So, are y'all with me? So, we're going to come back whatever that is Thursday, and we're going to talk about an efficiency wage. And how did that do that? Those get a way to uh, make the economy grow at, you know, what they can play. Uh, try that again. You know, as you said, raise the minimum wage won't help, but is there a way that you can, you know, increase the economy? Oh, okay. grow the economy without causing inflation? Um, almost. We're going to talk about inflation in the next step. There's two types of inflation. There's a, there's a good kind and a bad kind. And it's okay to keep growing the economy and end up with a good kind of inflation. Namely, prices go up because workers are working more and being more productive and making more. That's fine because your paycheck is going up at the same time price is going up. We're okay with that. And that's coming from that supply side. What we can do to increase supply of making it easier for business to do stuff. The bad kind of inflation is when prices are going up and the wages are not going up. Because demand is changing or something like that is going on. But that's the ugly kind of inflation. So, then you can't get economic growth. Economic growth is going to come with inflation, but it's just a matter of which kind of inflation you end up getting, whether it ends up being a problem or not. We'll talk about that maybe Thursday, but probably next Tuesday. Any other questions? Okay.